Hey, this is Zach. Thanks for joining us. We are going for our MIT autonomous driving update. So some of you might have remembered that a bunch of months ago we had um, Sparky into Cambridge where we joined the MIT autonomous driving study. So that's a study where they see what happens when a driver drives autonomously like I'm doing now. Do we get more tired? Or do we stay more alert? So what we're doing now is we're going into MIT to get our hard drive changed out. What they do is they put a bunch of cameras in Sparky that watch me, that watch the road, that watch my hands, and they take all that data and they store it in the hard drive in the back of the car. And every two or three months that hard drive gets full. So we have to go down to Cambridge, have them swap out the hard drive, and we thought while we're down there today, maybe we could do an interview and see what kind of data they're getting. So come on along. All right, so I'm here with Dan Brown of the MIT Autonomous Driving Study, and we're gonna pick his brain a little bit and see if he can maybe give us some gleanings on the data that you've been seeing. So you've been studying my car and my driving for, I don't know, it's been like nine months or something now, Yeah, I think. something about that. So you've changed out the hard drive a couple times, and you have how many other cars in your study? We have about 15 other Teslas currently. Within that, we do have four other uh, research vehicles that we own uh, that we also test out those advanced types of technologies within them. And what are you looking for when I'm driving the car? We're trying to find out anything we can about how you as a human interact with the technology inside of the car. Okay. It's something that's not very well understood how a driver behaves with autopilot on or you know during emergency braking what happens during that event. Interesting, because I talk to a lot of people about autopilot and I try and explain to them what it is and the first reaction I get is I will not let a car drive me. That's usually the first. And the second is if I did, I'm sure I would get sleepier. Do you see that showing up in the data that people are getting more tired with autopilot on? So we haven't dug that deep yet into it. What we have seen is Tesla owners that have autopilot like to use it. We haven't seen whether they get sleepy or tired or distracted even but they do like using it, okay. uh, and they use it often. Oh, interesting. A lot of people actually try and turn it on in places where arguably it shouldn't be used. <laughs> like back um, roads and stuff yep. like that? Uh, and more importantly, there's a lot of re-engagement after disengagement. So if the system disengages for whatever reason or the driver takes over in a sticky situation, mm -hmm. um, as soon as they can turn it back on, it seems like they do. So you're saying they turn it back on and try and get the car to... It seems drive. like that, at least for highway driving. Also, you have to keep in mind, we only have a few, like 16 cars in the study. So it's not a huge sample size, mm -hmm. as whether or not that's representative of everybody. But uh, there are some particular drivers who like to use it and you know want to use it as much as they can. Interesting. You have about 19, 20 cars that you're studying right now. Could you take like 100 cars? Or are you pretty much at your max level with your crew? Uh, with our crew, we're probably like close to that. It's not improbable to scale up. Uh, I just I'm not quite sure if that's where the research is uh, headed right now. So, but you would like some new drivers as old drivers like me get off of the program, right? Absolutely. We do want to keep the fleet size at the same amount. Okay, so if you're out there and you're interested, um, definitely contact us or MIT Autonomous Group. We'll leave the link down below because they probably put you on a list, right? And then if you're a good fit for the the group. They do pay you, by the way. So I get paid every time I come into MIT. Dan's paying me right now to interview <laughs> him. Um, so that's really nice. They, they pay the participants and you're contributing to the scientific data that you're getting. Yep. Who's interested in this data? So a lot of the people that are interested are automotive companies as well as insurance companies. Oh, interesting. Uh, we do not sell, we do not necessarily share data unless very specific things are requested. But uh, as of yet, we have shared very little to no data. We always share our, our findings at this point. We will take input from those um, sponsors, but we're not going to fork over necessarily all of the data that we have. Interesting. Them. So manufacturers would want to know the stuff so that they would know what, like how to implement this in their cars or whether they should? Right, so from my understanding, a lot of manufacturers like to do research and development on other vehicle systems whether that's to get at how they work or from an engineering perspective mm -hmm. or to understand what they could do better in their own cars. Um, I think it's a little bit of both for, for the sponsors that we have. Uh, it's nice that they are interested in systems other than their own mm -hmm. uh, and not necessarily just trying to fight against them. Now we notice in your office here you have a simulator. Yes. Um, what is that for? That simulator is a driving simulator um, and it's mostly used for testing out you know theories or very conceptual ideas that may not necessarily be a good idea to test in a car on the road <laughs> so you know driving with your cell phone and you know testing a, an app or something for distraction not the best idea to put someone on the road and do that but we're able to do that with the simulator that we have that's cool now do you need um, participants for that study 
Absolutely. We're, we're always looking for participants in general. Uh, if you go to the agelab.mit.edu website, there is a place there where you can sign up uh, to be a participant in any of our studies. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so check that out if you're interested in coming on into MIT and being part of the scientific research they're doing, because that, that looks like a lot of fun. Yep. And there's no risk. You're and you gonna, get paid. And, and you get paid, and you're not going to smash into anything, yep. which is pretty cool. Um, awesome digs you have here. So you've moved buildings. There's construction going on like crazy down here yep. in Cambridge. So you're in a nicer spot at the moment yeah, than at you the were. Moment. Uh, we're a little further away uh, from the main MIT campus, mm -hmm. but it's a very nice uh, office for, for us. So you're getting reams, of, there's three cameras in my car, so you're getting three video streams. Yes. Does a person sit there and watch all of it? Like, how do you crunch all that? So th thankfully, no, we don't watch all of it, and that would be a pain. It goes actually to say that there's a lot of pre-processing and a lot of engineering, a lot of software work that it takes to take all of that data, that raw data that we have, make sure everything is perfectly lined up in time mm -hmm. because the cameras are recording at 30 frames a second. Mm -hmm. So 33 milliseconds is, you know, if you lose this, if you're off by a second, something you know, oh, it may change, it doesn't line up anymore. Uh, we have different sensors on the car, so GPS and IMU all record at different rates. So synchronizing everything up to be perfectly lined up. So we can say at this point in time, when we see you turn on autopilot, that another value changes for whatever reason. Oh, because you're getting also not only the video stream, but you're getting data from the car. Yep, we collect CAN data from the car. So, so we what know, is CAN data? Uh, CAN is the controller area network on the car. Oh, okay. And that passes around all sorts of both vehicle telemetry data as well as uh, status information. So we get vehicle speed, we know how much you're turning the steering wheel, uh, how much you're pressing on the, the accelerator pedal or the brake pedal, whether or not you're using auto, autopilot. Uh, and more specifically, we can know if the autopilot system detects your hands on the wheel or not. Oh, interesting. So that breaks down a lot of you know, we don't have to watch all the video and, right. and physically annotate it necessarily to find those points in time. Interesting. What are the most interesting points in time for you? So far, the most interesting points in time are things, the transfers of control. When you give control up of the vehicle to the car, okay. and when you take it back, or for whatever reason, the car gives control back to you. And then you can see what the car was seeing at that moment. So, Because yep. you also have a camera looking out the front along with all the telemetry data. So when the car gives back control to me, he goes, doo -doo, you know, I can't do this anymore. You look at that and go, why did the car do that? Right. Is that kind of, yep, that's exactly and, and right. what did the driver do at it's, that point? It's like, mostly what, yeah, what did the driver do? Did the driver respond in time? Did they stop everything else they were doing and immediately take control back? Were they confused about the situation? Uh, it seems like Tesla owners are a rare breed of people that really learn and understand the system and how it works and use it very effectively. Interesting. Okay, so tell me about that. So you, you, you mentioned you've got other cars besides Teslas. So yes. you, you've got some uh, Volvos, I guess, yeah. and uh, what'd you say? Uh, Range Rover. Range Rover. Rover. And so those drivers, and so, so some of these cars you loan out to people. Yes. So are those drivers different, do you notice, in the data set? Um, from what we've seen, yes, but it should go without saying that they don't own those vehicles. They they're, haven't. They're spent, newer. At them. They're, yeah, exactly. So they haven't spent hours driving in them necessarily to understand all the little lights and dings and and, and things sounds that come from the car. So over time, it's possible that they get very used to it and understand it. Mm -hmm. But uh, there is um, confusion about what some of the symbols mean, how they operate some of the systems. It's not very intuitive. Whereas Tesla owners, whether or not, you know, it's because it's the type of person who buys a Tesla, mm -hmm. or it's because the systems inside the Tesla are very intuitive and easy to use, which is what I think, um, that drivers just get it. And that, you know, when you see those red hands come up on the, on the instrument cluster and that, that, you know, blaring beeping sound, you mm -hmm. put your hands right back on the wheel. Right. And it's obvious what you're supposed to do and what's going on. Now, you've been watching since Tesla had some updates, right? And one of the updates I noticed was they put a white uh, flashing light on the instrument cluster to tell you, like, put your hands on the wheels. Yes. Um, did you notice any difference um, when that change came about? Because before that, I guess it was a little bit harder to notice, um, you know, it, something would change, I forget what it was, it changed blue or something, but like, yeah. it, it wasn't a big, like, boo, boo, put your hands back on the wheel. Yeah, so it seems like uh, there was a little more re-engagement from the driver to let the system know that, yes, I'm, I'm a human, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm still alive. alive. I'm still, I'm still here. Whereas it seemed like the old system was just, um, you know, just keep driving pretty much unless something came up. So I don't think we've seen a huge change other than 
Uh, you know, even though that was implemented, drivers are still saying, okay, I don't mind, you know, wiggling the steering wheel a little bit to let it know that I'm there. there. Um, have you heard any anecdotal stories of people doing anything like really stupid or like, I remember one time we tried to just ignore it and see what it would do on the highway and it basically starts to slow down. It's like it thinks that you're dead or whatever. Right. Um, have you seen anybody fall asleep or do something like that? We haven't seen anything uh, too crazy. Uh, I would say um, maybe just one of the things is what I mentioned before is uh, some drivers like to just re-engage autopilot as much as possible. Even if the system cuts out, it, they just, just want to it turn it in. back in. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that today driving in with the rain. Um, usually it's fantastic in the rain to the point where I'm like, how can it, you know, the windshield wipers haven't even really caught up and it's still letting me drive in yep. autopilot. Um, but then there's some times where it seems to take a minute or two before it'll let you go into autopilot on a rainy day. And I'm thinking to myself, is that because it's having to do more GPS data and find out where I am? Uh, it's not comfortable yet. It's, it's interesting. Have you noticed the cars getting smarter at all? Like with the fleet learning that's going on? Uh, it's entirely possible. I'm not quite sure, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, I will say that it seems like in the little bit of video that I have watched of the Ford roadway that test the autopilot system does like to engage a little bit more uh, as time goes on given the road conditions. Interesting. So um, I actually happened to see uh, in your case there was a railroad crossing that you would drive through mm -hmm. and the red hands would come up and it happened both at day and at night. Mm -hmm. But that's only happened twice in what we've seen. So I'm going under the assumption that the vehicle has learned and is able to figure out how to pass through that yeah. road without you know, uh, giving control back to you. Right, because I noticed on the first 8.0 update that the car seemed to be dumbed down again. Mm -hmm. Many people were complaining like, hey, what it could do yesterday, now it can't do. And then it did seem within a couple weeks that it got smart right away, like it relearned a lot of things. Yeah. So it is interesting to be in a car that seems to be learning um, I, I think it is, right? It's some, some variant of fleet learning that's going on. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very good point. Uh, I think in general it's something that we're interested in to see how drivers respond to a vehicle that's ever changing. Right. Um, and right, because I mean yeah. most model years you get used to this is a 2012 and this is what it can do, but no, in a, in a Tesla like it's evolving and changing all the time and you have to kind of get used to the new operating system, the new UI, yep. right? Um, interesting to see that like because many people don't like that. They like to, they want to know what it can do, how it works. They don't want to get used to a refresh. I, I noticed when the refresh came out of like the entertainment system, first few weeks, people hated it. I can't find my favorite stations. I can't do this and that. Now I don't hear that much anymore. I guess it's kind of like, you know, with Facebook or anything else, like yep. changes, people don't like change. Yep. That's interesting. Um, we took a friend of ours, Steven Solowski, for his first drive in, in an autopilot car. And I remember, put him behind the wheel, and I remember in 12 seconds, he was just like, oh, cool, this is awesome. And he was just like, not touching the wheel, whatever. Whereas most people that go behind the wheel are like, uh, yep. uh, um, do you get to see, you must get to see some, you know, because the cameras are on the camera, uh, on the car, no matter who's driving it. Right. Do you get to see some new drivers driving AP? So unless those drivers are consented, no, we don't oh, get to see them. Oh, you just chop them off? Yep. Gotcha. Um, so we do look at raw data in general. It's easy to look at CAN data or GPS data, or raw usage, but when it comes to analyzing, you know, let's say uh, gaze or, or body pose or things like that, unless they are the consented driver in the study, uh, you can't we, look at it. Yeah, we, we do not look at that. So what are you looking at for me uh, as a driver um, at these key moments, you know, when autopilot turns on and off? You're looking at my eyes yep. to see where I'm looking. Um, what, what You just mentioned like body pose. What, what is that? So uh, basically how you're sitting in the seat. Are you slouched? Are you standing up? Oh, you can tell um, all that. Part of it is, you know, do you have your hand out? Are you looking at your phone? Mm -hmm. That also plays into, you know, where you're looking, uh, where your head is pointed in the vehicle as well. Interesting. So that's why insurance companies especially might be interested in this kind of data to see, like, what are drivers doing in these autopilot cars? Are they distracted more, taking out their cell phones more, things like that I would imagine they're interested in? Yep. Um, when I'm driving an autopilot, because I can look around longer, I tend to see what people are doing in the other cars longer, and I see so many people texting. Um, I got to imagine that that's creating a lot of this increase we've been seeing in accident rates in the past couple of years. Um, do you see autopilot as contributing to that? Do you think that it's going to help that with texting and distracted driving? Or you 
as a hopeful uh, person of automated technology, yes, I hope that that's you know what that can create so that you know people don't get into so many accidents. Uh, it is weird that we have been seeing an uptick in in automotive uh, deaths on road, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's because of using more technology in a car like cell phones. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not quite sure. I think about that, but um, I don't think automated technology can necessarily hurt us by trying it out. Right. Uh, and so far, it seems to be pre pre pretty good. That's interesting. So how much longer do you think the study will go for? Is it the kind of thing that you just have to wait and see what kind of grant money you get? Or do you have a plan? Uh, it's partially wait and see, but I believe we are looking to continue the study for at least six months, if not into uh, the next year oh, or awesome. into another year. And you're probably not interested in having me continue with you for another year because you've, after about a year, you've probably gotten my data. Like, I'm not that useful anymore. Right. So right. we are just a, a small research lab. Uh, we were collecting a lot of data that I'm sure people over the next, you know, 10 years at this lab will continue to comb through and find new interesting things. Uh, it will be ever interesting to see how changes in software affect uh, the driving scenario as well as you as a human, how do you re interact with those different ever-changing systems as well. Um, would it be great to have you? Yes, absolutely. I just, I'm not quite sure that the study is structured in a right. way to, to have uh, participants on longer than a year. Right. Now, you just brought up an interesting point, which is when you get my data, you might have more data than you know what to do with. Yes. And so you might go back for another round to look at new things that you weren't even thinking of looking at or couldn't afford to look at the first time. Yes. So, like, we, like I mentioned earlier, 99% of driving uh, that is done is probably boring and, and not all that interesting, mm -hmm. especially if you're only interested in very key specific scenarios that occur. So we do keep all of our raw data. Um, a lot of work has been put in on the engineering side to figure out a data pipeline such that we can process all of the video, all of the canned data, uh, but then still be able to go back, you know, months or years later to reprocess that data from the raw stuff. Um, maybe we have new, new questions or new insights, something that we didn't really comb through at the beginning to go back and do it, but not have to start all over again in that whole process. Gotcha, because I thought at the beginning of the study what you were interested in was to know that when I'm in AP, uh, hands off the wheels, am I like drifting off to sleep? But you're probably, it sounds like, not that interested in that at the moment. Oh, we're very interested in it. We were interested in a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. If we had a lot more researchers, we could definitely get to a lot of it. Uh, it's just, you know, a time, time constraint and uh, you know, just heat bodies, we, we, you know, could have more researchers and, and spend a lot more time researching. We have a lot of really cool, interesting research projects going on right now. Um, and we hop from one thing to another just because, you know, deadlines and papers and things like that. So it's hard to just sit down for a good month and really crunch the numbers mm -hmm. on something. So at least a couple of questions. One is you're, you're probably looking for researchers, are you? Like, are, are you looking uh, for anyone? We're always right interested in people who, who want to join, who have the expertise in human factors or software engineering. Um, we're more than happy to talk with people. Uh, I don't know if I'm not the right person to ask that question mm -hmm. to necessarily, but I would say, you know, if the right person came along, you know, as a postdoc or a researcher, absolutely be Interesting. welcome. Interesting. And um, how can people find out about what you're discovering? Is this something that eventually will be published in some kind of paper or put on a website or is it? Yes. Um, I think it's a great idea that you mentioned earlier to have a website that kind of details some of the higher level things that we're looking for and that we've seen. Mm -hmm. it's, that's it's really cool. Um, but yeah, so very soon we want to publish uh, our data that we've collected, at least on some small subset of questions. Oh, cool. So we should be looking for that to see what you guys are finding Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Oh, that's exciting. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today, You're Dan, welcome. to show me all around your cool offices yeah. and to show me what, what you guys do. This has been uh, really eye-opening to me. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. I think that for years to come, this data is probably going to make people safer. We just probably haven't even wrapped our heads around it yet. Yep. That's, that's the plan. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks. Maybe we could do an interview and see what kind of data they're getting. Come along. Shall you? Shall me? What will you? <laughs> So come on along.